Hello everybody and welcome to a new Let's Play campaign of mine. I'm going to be playing Crusader Kings 2, as you may well have gathered if you have already played Crusader Kings 2. So, where to begin? I've chosen to play as Sweden. Um, Sweden has a number of interesting features which I will explain in due course. However, to start from the beginning, I should probably explain the differences between CK2 and Europa Universalis. Um, EU3 was the first of Paradox's games that I began to play, and I'm just going to pick the music down a second. And yeah, it took a bit of getting used to, and it was definitely the most complicated game I'd played to date. But it was nothing compared to the other Paradox games I've played since then. Um, Crusader Kings 2 is one of the more complicated ones. It doesn't quite beat Hearts of Iron 3, however. I'm still, still struggling with that. So the main difference is that you're not really playing as a country, as you would be in the other games. You're playing as a dynasty. So that's you, your family, your brothers, your <laughs> lovers, your rivals, <laughs> you name it. Countries, land, they're, they're more of an asset for your family. They strengthen them, they give them, it gives, owning land gives your family prestige. As such, a big part of the game is what happens when your character dies. All of his possessions are divvied up between his eligible claimants. This is established by the laws that take place in the land. Now, I've not played through as Sweden before. I had a brief try, um, but when I make a let's play, I do like to go in semi-blind, not knowing what to expect. It's probably be a good time to point out that if you're looking for <clears throat> Elite Pro Hacks gameplay or <laughs> perfect playthroughs, this isn't the channel for you. I, I do play this for to have a unique story really. Every every paradox game is unique when you play it through. And I just like to share that. So looking in Sweden here at the Royal Laws, we have Agnetic, Cognetic, Elective. So let me just read what this means. Elective basically means that anyone with a title can vote upon who they would like to be the heir. I generally consider it to be the best form of inheritance because you can really work on strengthening your family and whoever inherits should be in a good position. If you're playing as primogeniture, where your oldest son inherits everything, you do generally want to keep your rivals, like your brothers and their heirs, fairly weak, just so you won't threaten your son. With elective, however, the whole kind of house and can work together and choose the best there. Um, speaking of house, we are playing as the uh, House of Stenkill. One of these days I will do a let's play in a place whose names I can actually pronounce. <laughs> so please forgive my terrible Swedish. So yeah, we're playing as the House of Stenkill. I'm currently King Stenkill of Sweden. And I own the Kingdom of Sweden, the Duchy of Lula, <laughs> and three counties here. Uh, I have a son, Prince Eric. Four sons, in fact. Prince Eric, Prince Halston, Prince Hakan, <laughs> and Prince Inge. I did have some siblings, but they are dead. So it does actually seem to be a fairly easy family structure to manage at the moment. We've only got four siblings to worry uh, four children to worry about. There were no jealous siblings on the outskirts. I have ten vassals. Vassals are under the feudal system, vassals are people who would swear fealty to you. They would give you money, troops, and in return they would want expect your protection. So to expand our borders, um, we, we're looking for people to swear fealty to us. If we look here, um, the game's made of, of different ranks of people. This guy is a K2 
count, so he could swear fealty to us as we were king. You know, we were above him, we outrank him. If we found any independent dukes who weren't swearing fealty for any, to anybody, uh, Ireland is a good example of this. Here we have Duke Murchad of Munster. We can ask him to swear fealty to us, offer, offer him vassalisation. He won't say no, obviously, because we're far away and he doesn't know us. And if he accepted, then these two counties would become it would become under our de jure kingdom. Now, de jure kingdoms is something that's a very important concept in the game. The best way to explain it is the de jure kingdom would be all of your cores in EU free speak. Just to demonstrate the uh, not a bit too high. Um, <laughs> the de jure kingdom of Sweden is demonstrated here. Obviously modern day Sweden is a lot bigger and incorporates Finland, but at the moment this is the de jure part of it. Now the actual kingdom of Sweden is those territories that declare fealty to us and are represented here by Sweden. <laughs> um, so we can approach these guys, we can... oh. He will actually just um, swear fealty to us off the bat. So fantastic, we can send that. He'll consider, and when he gets back to us, he should say yes, and he, Dal, will become part of our kingdom. It is part of the Dejur kingdom, so that's probably why he's um, willing to accept us as king. That and the fact that we do <laughs> outpower him. So this territory up here is also part of our kingdom, but the owners of the land don't recognise us as rulers. Um, if we offer vassalisation to them, they're not willing to accept that. And we can see here that's due to a number of reasons. Um, they don't want to give up their independence. They're not recognising it as the de jure... Ah, okay. I was asking the wrong guy. <laughs> okay, he, he's still not willing to accept it because of religion. There is a lot of religious difference in Sweden at the moment. Half of the kingdom appears to be Catholic, like most of the Western world, and part of it is pagan. I'm not going to even attempt to pronounce some of these <laughs> religions here, but yeah, there's a lot of religious strife and differences here. Having so many members of the kingdom be under a different kind of religion is going to be very interesting. It's going to lead to a lot of internal strife and we should be seeing some rebellions fairly soon. Um, our ruler is Catholic so we're going to be wanting to replace the pagans with Catholics just to keep the Pope happy and maintain smooth relations within the realm. Having uh, well having different territories having a different religion it does give you a casus belli to go to war with them. Another difference in this game bet between this game and EU3 for example is the fact that you can't just declare war on somebody, you have to have a casus belli. So that's another advantage of playing as Sweden, you are surrounded by pagan heretics and there's always going to be areas to expand. We're not alone in wanting to expand out and conquer them though. I mean, further on the subject of religion, um, the game is called Crusader Kings, so there's always going to be some crusades taking place. Um, the Pope, down here, in the Papal States, uh, will often be calling for a crusade on different parts of the Muslim world. Most often it's Jerusalem, but they can intervene in Spain with the Reconquista, or, you know, random parts of Africa. Okay, so I've touched briefly on the laws before. It's going to be a priority to get our crown authority up pretty high. Um, the, the higher that is, the more we can actually do within our kingdom. At the moment, we have autonomous vassals. Um, they, there's nothing really we can do as a king. We, we have the title king, but we don't have the power that goes along with it. 
I'll explain some of these laws in more detail later, but the most important concept to get across is the fact that there's a cost and benefit to changing the laws. If we look at feudal levies, for example, this determines how much of your vassal's armies they're required to give to you. If we have it at minimum, they obviously they're legally required to give you much, much less troops. Bad English, <laughs> um, but they'll like you for it. Okay, you'll we'll get a modifier to our opinion by plus ten. If we accept the max uh, law for feudal levies, they'll have to give us their entire army when we want it. But they're going to hate us. They're well, not hate us. They're, they're going to have a modifier to our opinion of minus five. And the reason this is important is because when it comes to taxation or levies, the amount you get from your vassals depends on how much they like you. Now I haven't done the maths behind it, but I will look into it at some point, I promise. If you have somebody <coughs> who loves you, they'll probably give you a lot more than somebody would if they hate you and, and the law says that they have to give you a lot. Just to explain it in more detail, um, this guy here, Eric, the Jarl of Upland, he's not paying us any tax because, well, he hates us. Whereas, if we can find someone who likes us, anyone, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, Tarkay here, uh, he is paying us um, 3.7 or 14.9 per year because his opinion of us is quite high. So when it comes to laws, I do try to balance being liked and still expecting something from my vassals. The first thing I have is I do want to increase my crown authority. I mentioned earlier that there's a lot of religious strife, and getting the crown law up to medium authority will allow me to revoke their titles without a war. That saves me having to wait for them to rebel. Okay, so I think I'll call it there for the introduction. Um, join me next time and I'm going to discuss our council and we may actually start playing. Thanks for watching guys.